Eric, you can still pull a crowd. It's so impressive. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Tom Jessel. I'm one of the co-directors of the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute um, of Columbia University. And on behalf of the Institute and the larger world of Columbia, I'd like to welcome you all to this first of this set of Stavros Niarchos Foundation Brain Insight Lectures. So I just want to give you two words of explanation about this wonderful collision, if you like, of the Niarchos Foundation and the Zuckerman Institute. The Zuckerman Institute, as many of you know, is Colombia's new hub for interdisciplinary research, which will provide a new center for exploration of issues of brain and mind that engages researchers in the biomedical sciences, in the School of Arts and Science, the engineering, the business school, and no stone of Columbia will go unturned in terms of the Zuckerman Institute's impact. And the Nyakos Foundation has added enormously to this initial um, burst of energy um, surrounding the Zuckerman Institute because it provides two things. In the form of this lecture series, it introduces some of Columbia faculty who will then um, provide um, insight, as the lecture series says, to what they're doing um, designed for a general group of faculty, colleagues, a group of local community, those curious, and essentially everyone in New York that is alive should be attending these lectures. <laughs> and you can see most of them are. Um, and the other thing the Niarchos Foundation has done is that it has realized that the future of the science of brain and mind is vested in the youth of today. So it has sponsored at Columbia a teacher scholars program where we equip teachers who have enormous innate talent to go out and do perhaps a better job in engaging um, the future neural scientists, the brain, brain mindologists of tomorrow. And what's particularly pleasing about tonight is that many of the people I've just been talking about are here in person. So um, Mort Zuckerman, Andreas Dracopoulos, Stelios, um, and all of those teachers are hovering over there. So rather than, um, you know, uh, they're all a shy and retiring mob. So maybe if you just wave your hands um, on the front, those the people can appreciate what you've done for Columbia, I think would be wonderful. Um, But I think you're all here to listen to tonight's lecturer, who is someone who I think embodies the heart and soul of Columbia Brain and Mind, and that is Eric Kandel. So I want you to imagine that you're going to any city of reasonable size in the Western Hemisphere, and you're standing in a street and you accost the first thousand people that walk by and ask them to name a neuroscientist. I think you'd learn two things from that exercise. The first is that most people wouldn't have the faintest idea what a neuroscientist was, and the second thing is that those few who did would without doubt have named Eric Kandel as the one neuroscientist that they know. But Eric is so much more than a neural scientist. Um, he is and has acquired the skills of molecular biology. He is a trained psychiatrist. And so in my opening remarks, I just want to sort of point out this multifaceted aspect of Eric's accomplishments that provides a challenge and an inspiration to all of us here at Columbia. So when I think of Eric as molecular biologist, I'm reminded of um, another distinguished mo molecular biologist, Alfred Hershey, who um, 
himself, also a Nobel Prize winner for his work on bacteriophage, when someone asked Hershey for his definition of scientific happiness, he said, it's when I do the same experiment every time and it always gives me new insight. And Eric <laughs> has created his own world of Hershey heaven, as it's called. I call it sort of, um, what shall I call it? Um, Candel, um, let's think, Candel contentment, shall we call it? Because if you see a smile on Eric's face, it's because he realizes that he's only had one aim scientifically in his career, and that is to understand the human condition through the study of memory. And with each progressive set of experiments spread over this 50 plus year time scale, he's moved ever closer to that goal. So Eric, as I'll show you in a minute, is in Hershey heaven. The psychiatrist in Eric represents a different provenance. It's the provenance of Alois Alzheimer and Emil Kraepelin, the first describers of Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer, you know, revealed the pathological basis, and Kraepelin postulated that there was a specific pathology underlying each of the major psychiatric disorders that afflict humans. And Eric, in a sort of Kraepelin-like way, I think maintains this confidence that it will someday be possible to identify the pathological basis of psychiatric disorders. And I think you'll hear this in the lecture. Recently, he's begun to address this fascinating problem of the distinction between memory loss that is a function of normal longevity and that with a more corrosive pathology underlying it. And these advances at a molecular level together with Columbia colleagues are very significant. And now finally, I want to turn to the neuroscientist in Eric. And this is just my editorial view that the real brilliance of Eric was to take the large psychological canon of phenomenology and condense that and reduce that to a single synapse with two or at most three interacting neurons and to show how that explains many aspects of our underlying psychology. But you get, I've just touched on the science of Eric. There's so much more to Eric these days. You cannot run into an art historian who hasn't invited Eric to write a little essay on Chaim Soutine or de Kooning or Jeff Koons even these days. And so, you know, we are dealing with a phenomenon here in Eric where I want to try and indicate with data how when you engage Eric, you get more than you could possibly have imagined. You get more sometimes than you bargained for, and sometimes you get more than you really wanted. Um, <laughs> so this week is Nobel week. The Nobel Prizes are being awarded, and it's perhaps no coincidence that in physiology and medicine, the prizes were awarded to people studying the phenomenon of memory, the ability of individuals or of animals to work out where they are in this big world around us through coding of neurons in the hippocampus, an area that Eric loves dearly. And this Nobel theme allows me to provide data that supports the idea that when you engage Eric, you get more than you bargain for. Because one of the things the Nobel Foundation requires you to do is to write a short autobiographical essay on how you came to be where you are. And so what I'm going to do is present to you six very distinguished eminent neuroscientists tabulated as the length of their autobiographical essay. And I'm going to ask Andreas here to pick out which one he thinks might be Eric's autobiographical essay. So <laughs> these are the six. Andreas, come on, use your neurobiological skills to hazard a guess there. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll see who these are, actually. So this is David Hubel. 
Eric, Rita Levin Moltalcini, Irvin Nair, Charles Sherrington, and coming in at 527 words as opposed to the 16,000 that Eric felt compelled to give is Torsten Weasel, uh, another New York fixture here. So this indicates Eric's uncanny ability to describe his passions and enthusiasms in science through the written word. And maybe because of that, it wasn't a big surprise that on the, in the wake of this, Eric started to write books that documented his account of his life in neuroscience writ large. And those books, in some cases, became films. And so here we have two of these. Here is Eric in Hershey Heaven, smiling away here. Um, and this is a film made of the book In Search of Memory by Petra Seeger. And on the right is Eric's latest contribution, which begins to express his vein of artistic interest and talent and enthusiasm in um, constructing in a remarkable way the consilience of activities in Vienna in the turn of the century. So I cannot begin to describe how everyone at Columbia has benefited from Eric's insight, his challenge, the standards he holds others to. And so it's a particular pleasure tonight to introduce Eric, to invite him to give this lecture we are what we remember, um, memory and age-related memory disorders. So Eric, come up here and relieve me of this burden of introduction. That is the most remarkable introduction I have ever received. And um, I'm not as young as I look. <laughs> I've been around the block a little bit, but that was absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, I simply wish my parents were here to really hear you because my father would be proud and my mother would have believed you. <laughs> I'm really delighted to have the chance uh, to join you this evening and to talk about uh, memory. Uh, memory is really one of the most magical capabilities of the mind. Learning, as you know, is the means whereby we acquire new information of the world, and memory is the process whereby we retain that knowledge over time. Most of the knowledge we have about the world, we've learned, and most of our skills are not built into our brain, but are also learned. As a result of this knowledge built over a lifetime, we are in good measure who we are of what we learn and what we remember. Moreover, as Tom pointed out, specific disorders of learning and disturbance of memory haunt the developing infant as well as the mature adult. Mental retardation affect the quality of life for young people while the, of weakening, the normal weakening of memory with age and the devastation of Alzheimer's disease haunts the elderly. Memory is the glue that holds our mental life together. Without the unifying force of memory, our consciousness will be broken into as many fragments as there are seconds in the day. Without memory, our life would be empty and meaningless. Imagine a life without memory. We see this in a tragic a fate of a person we're going to hear from in a second, Clive Waring, whose image I depict here. Waring is a brilliant musician who more than 20 years ago suffered from a brain infection, herpes encephalitis, that destroyed his hippocampus and medial temporal lobe and produced a dramatic loss of memory. Here is Clive Waring. How many years have I been ill? About 20. About 20. Can you imagine it's right to have one night 20 years long with no dream? That's what it's been like. Just like death. No difference between day and night, no thoughts at all. In that sense, it's been totally painless. Which is not something which is very desirable, really, is it? Because it's precisely like death. If you have no senses of pain, you have no sense of any kind working either. I don't remember sitting down on this chair, for example, or the settee as it is. That was unknown to me. 
I've never seen a human being since I've been... That's the first photograph I've seen of anybody. And who is that photograph? It's one of my sons. I can't remember his name. Tragic. The problem of memory can be simply divided into two parts. The systems of problem of memory, which ask the question, where in the brain is memory stored? And the molecular problem of memory, how at each of these sites does the storage occur? Let me begin with the systems problem of memory. By the middle of the 20th century, we knew that many fairly complicated mental processes, such as language, could be localized to specific regions of the brain. So we know the articulation, the motor aspects of memory were located in the front of the brain in Broca's area, right near the vocalization area that controls the vocal cords, while the perceptive area, called Wernicke's area, is in the back of the brain where sensory information comes into the brain. But it raised the question whether memory, which is such a complicated function, has so many facets to it, could also be localized to a specific region. And there were several outstanding people, including Carl Lashley, professor of psychology at Harvard. It's not Columbia, but you gotta get a job in academia. So he <laughs> end, ended up at Harvard, and he was convinced that memory could not be localized to a specific function of the brain. And the reason he argued this is because he used a particular complex maze task to test for memory. And mice and rats, subjects of his experiments, are very smart. If you deprive them of visual input, they'll use tactile or olfactory information in order to find their way. If you deprive them of tactile information, they'll use vision so they can compensate for one another. But nonetheless, he was not aware of this, and he used this task and convinced many people. Things changed when Wilde the Peltfield came along the scene. Trained as Columbia, who was an outstanding neurosurgeon, he went to the Montreal Neurological Institute and became interested in sort of higher mental functions. And he wanted to explore that in a wake subject undergoing operation. And he specialized in people who had epilepsies due to head trauma that left a scar tissue on their brain which produced the epilepsy. But in order to make sure he doesn't damage Broca's area, Wernicke's area, areas that are essential for the patient's function, he developed a procedure whereby he could operate on unanesthetized patients. He injected a local anesthetic into the scalp, opened up the scalp, opened up the skull, and knew that the brain itself doesn't have pain receptors. So now he could work freely on the brain without having any worry. So in order to make sure that the areas around the scar tissue were not critical for functioning, he would stimulate different areas of the brain and see what he would elicit in the patient. And it was marvelous. He would stimulate one area, patient would have visual experiences. He stimulated another area, he'd have motor experiences. He wrote to Sherrington, who spent all of his career working on cats, and he said, imagine having a preparation that talks back to you. And then he found all of a sudden, when he stimulated certain areas, he got hallucinations. People remembered certain experiences. You know, bumping into Charles Zucker at the candy store, uh, meeting friends, hearing a song that was played at their graduation. And this was remarkable. And they always found it in exactly the same area, in the temporal lobe, and a structure deep to it called the hippocampus. And he studied this with his colleague, Brenda Milner, and they were really becoming convinced that this was important for memory storage, but the really absolutely convincing evidence became when William Scoville operated in a patient that produced a very profound memory deficit. And the way this happened is a very interesting situation. The patient was known for many years as HM. We now know it is Henry Mollison. He died a few years ago. He was knocked over by somebody riding a bicycle, and that gave him scars on both sides of the temporal lobe. As a result of this, he had convulsions that initially were, were very well controlled with anticonvulsant medication. He was able to complete elementary school, go to high school, get himself a job, but with time, the seizures got worse and worse and could no longer be controlled. And he presented himself to Scoville for a surgical procedure to remove this scar tissue and the, the, the tissue deep to it. So Scoville operated on him and removed the hippocampus on both sides. 
This had never been done before. Penfield had only removed the hippocampus on one side. As a result of this bilateral removal of the hippocampus, HM was left with the most profound memory loss you could possibly imagine. Uh, Scoville was besides himself, extremely upset. Called up Penfield and he said, this is a tragedy. This was just terrible what happened here. Uh, and Penfield agreed, he said, look, the most useful thing we could do is to study HM and see what we can learn from it. Why don't I ask Brenda Milner, my colleague who's been studying these patients with me, to come and visit you and study HM. So she spent the next 15 years going back and forth between Montreal uh, and New Haven to visit with HM and really found out an enormous about about her. The first thing that struck her is how many memory functions he still retained, despite the fact that he seemed in some ways to be so completely amnestic, to have such a tremendous memory loss. For example, he could remember memories before the operation. He remembered the awkwardness of his childhood, you know, his first dating experiences. He remembered starting school. He remembered to speak perfectly good English. His IQ was unaltered. So memories that occurred prior to the operation are not stored in the hippocampus. Short-term memory, if you asked him, repeat after me, 8845447, he could do this. So you could give him new piece of information, he could remember it perfectly well for short periods of time. What he could not do was to connect short-term memory to long-term memory. He couldn't take new information and put it into new long-term memory. For the longest time, Brenda Milner thought this explained all of HM. And then she made another fantastic discovery. She found that even though he could not convert new short-term memory into long-term memory, he could learn new motor tasks. This is the way Brenda Miller discovered that. She had, she had HM do a mirror drawing task, whereby he drew the outlines of a star, not by looking at his hand or at the pencil, but by looking in a mirror, Leonardo da Vinci-like. This is difficult to do. When you and I do that, we make a lot of mistakes, the first trial. And the first day, doing 10 trials, we get progressively better. The second day, we start off with a few mistakes. We get better and better. Third day, we're perfect. This is not just you and me, this is also HM. He does as well as you and I do. But if you ask him, HM, how come you're doing so much better on Wednesday than you did on Monday, he would say, what are you talking about? I've never done this before in my life. <laughs> Seeing a dissociation between a conscious awareness of something and the motor skill. And we see this in Clive Waring. Clive Waring has one of the worst cases of amnesia in the world. I know it's like we did now. Day and night, same blank. No difference between dreams and anything like that. No senses at all. The brain has been totally inactive. No dreams and no thoughts of any kind, whatever. Clive was a renowned conductor living in London when he was struck down by a virus in 1985. Parts of his brain were completely destroyed, including his memory. However, his ability to play music is unaffected. Do you feel different when you play music? I've never heard a note since I've been ill. I don't know what it's like to play music. I mean, you're unconscious. You played us some music about two minutes ago. Not known to me. Totally unknown. I've never heard a note yet. Just amazing. He plays as well as he ever played. He conducts as well as he ever conducted. Completely unaware that he's done it a minute or two afterwards. De Kooning, when he had advanced dementia, Chuck Close describes this very well, would go into a studio and be a different person. All of a sudden, he would start to paint major works, not exactly of the quality of his early ones, but still extremely interesting, despite the fact that when he left the studio, 
he was essentially inarticulate. So this made one realize that memory is not a unitary faculty of mind. It exists in two very different forms, implicit and explicit. Explicit is what you normally think of memory. It's the conscious recall of facts and events about people, places, and objects. And this involves the medial temporal lobe and the hippocampus. And this was recognized in the Nobel Prize given out yesterday. And this requires conscious attention. Implicit memory, procedural memory, is memory for skills and habits, for non-associative and associative learning. It involves different structures, the amygdala, the cerebellum, and in the simplest cases, the reflex pathways themselves. This does not require conscious attention. So when you first learn how to ride a bicycle, you say to yourself, put your left foot forward, put your right foot forward, and you teach yourself how to ride the bicycle with the parent's help. After a while, if you talk to yourself, you fall off the bicycle. You don't want conscious attention. You do this automatically. So I'm going to focus primarily on explicit memory storage and I'm going to discuss with you what are the molecular underpinnings of this. We know from the work of the Moses and O'Keefe that the hippocampus which stores memory, is importantly concerned with space. Now, you couldn't tell this by a New York taxi driver, because if you ask him to go from 116th Street to 165th Street, he would get lost. But if you ask a London cabbie about this, they have to take tests in order to qualify. And in order to qualify, they do this training for some time. The hippocampus actually gets larger as a result of this experience. So if you ask him, the route, a cab driver in London, from Hyde Park to Primrose Road, the hippocampus lights up an image of the experiments. And the longer you drive the cab, the larger the hippocampus becomes. So there's an important lesson there. Don't ever stop driving your taxi. <laughs> now information about space, in fact, information about anything you can learn comes into what are called association cortices. That leads into the entorhinal cortex, which is the input phase into the hippocampus, which has both the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus proper. We can study the same thing in mice because they have an exactly similar structure to the hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex, and the association cortex. And we can use spatial tasks. You put a mouse onto a round platform that has 40 holes, and you shine light, and you play classical music. The mice hate classical music. <laughs> they hate the light. They're dying to get away from it. And the only way they can get away from it is to find one hole out of 40 that leads to an escape hatch that allows them to get away. And after, first they do randomly. They go to any hole. They see this is a mistake. Uh, then they become more systematic. They start with one hole and go systematically until they find the right one. And after a while, they eyes, aha, this is related to some particular marking on the wall. They pick out the marking on the wall and they go to it. And if you watch what happens with time, you see that with time, there's a strengthening of certain critical synaptic connections in the brain. You can actually see a growth of new synaptic connections in the brain. So let me just show you roughly what this looks like. In baseline, you have synapses ending on a neuron. So this is a presynaptic neuron. This is the target cell. In short-term memory, memory when you just repeat something for a brief period of time, you get a functional strengthening. So it acts more effectively, but there's no anatomical change. But with long-term changes, when you repeat something, so it goes into long-term memory, you have an alteration in the expression of genes, and I'll come to that in a moment, and actual growth of new synaptic connections. So you now have additional synapses that you didn't have before. What does that mean? This means that if you walk out of this lecture, remembering anything that you heard here, and this is not something that I urge on you, but if you insist in remembering anything, it's because you're walking out of this with a different head than you walked into this lecture. 
So this is the plasticity of the human brain. You find this in experimental animals as well. What are the molecular underpinnings of this? If we look at short-term memory, it's a change in the functional strength of a synaptic connection. The synapse in the hippocampus use glutamate as a transmitter, and you insert new receptors called AMP receptors to strengthen the synapses. But if you give repeated stimulation, interesting things happen. You recruit a modulatory system, which in the hippocampus is dopamine, could be other modulatory systems, serotonin, acetylcholine, and other regions of the brain. This activates an enzyme that generates an intracellular messenger called cyclic AMP that recruits the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase that translocates, moves into the nucleus, and there activates a gene that turns on long-term memory. That's called CREB, cyclic AMP response element binding protein. This is found in almost every memory storage, both implicit and explicit. And that gives rise, by acting on downstream targets, to the growth of new synaptic connections. Now, the nice thing about mice is we can do genetic experiments, and we can test how important is this cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase going into the nucleus, preventing it from activating CREB. Well, if we do that, and we do the same task we gave it before, this is a normal mouse, and this is a mouse in which the cyclic AMP system has been compromised. The long-term memory has been severely compromised. That puts one in a position to begin to explore things about how memory varies as a function of age. Now, I must tell you something very interesting. When I was a medical student, we never discussed Alzheimer's disease. We never discussed age-related memory loss. It's not that we didn't know about Alois Alzheimer. It's there were very few people who lived that long. One of the amazing things about the 20th century is that the age of people's life expectancy has increased dramatically. In 1900, this is not when I went to medical school. I went in the early 1950s, but still. <laughs> in 19, I know you think that I went, was born then. Uh, the average age life expectancy was 50 years. Now, 76 years for the weaker sex, 81 for women, the stronger sex. Remarkable. And many of these is a result of changes in life habits. Better diet, less smoking, you know, not eating fatty foods, exercising, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as a result of that, we began to see really significant amounts of Alzheimer's disease. There is a genetic form of Alzheimer's disease, which is very rare, that has an early onset. But the sporadic form, the, the form that people commonly suffer from, first makes itself manifest in the late 60s, early 70s, but really becomes significant in the 90s when half the population has it. But with time, people not only lived longer, but they lived better. And one began to see a weakening of memory that seemed to be slightly different from age-related memory loss, although it bore some similarities to it. And it was called euphemistically benign senescent forgetfulness. <laughs> and some people considered this a legitimate separate category. There wasn't any strong empirical evidence. Others thought that it was an early stage of Alzheimer's disease. And this is a problem that's interested a number of people, including my colleagues and myself, to ask the question, is normal aging a distinct entity or is it an early form of Alzheimer's disease? So we carried out a series of comparisons. We looked at the age of onset and the progression. We looked at the anatomical localization of the two disorders and the molecular defects involved. Let me take you through each of these. We find it difficult to do age of onset um, of age-related memory loss uh, alone in people because it's difficult to dissociate that from Alzheimer's disease. We don't have excellent ways of diagnosing early stage of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, but in mice, they don't have spontaneous Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at the mouse that I was showing you before, a young mouse does very well in this task, but as it reaches midlife, 
which is thought to be the onset of age-related memory loss, you begin to see a significant compromise in its ability to learn a spatial maze. Moreover, we had known for years that Alzheimer's disease begins in the entorhinal cortex. As Scott Small and others carried out imaging experiments, they found that there is a separate entity, this so-called age-related memory loss, that begins in the dentate gyrus, a rather discrete region quite separate from the entorhinal cortex. So we teamed up together to try to explore this in molecular terms to compare the dentate gyrus in the entorhinal cortex in people who died without having any evidence of Alzheimer's disease. And we carried out aphrometric chip experiments on post-mortem material from people 38 to 90 years old in which we took the dentate gyrus and compared it to the entorhinal cortex to see whether there were changes that were unique, distinctive to the dentate gyrus. And if so, that followed a systematic trend. And we found 19 candidates. As a first step, we explored one of them, RBAB48, because it really has such an interesting uh, change, a systematic change as a function of age. So this is the level of the messenger RNA for RBAB48, and this is the level of the protein. It systematically declines the function of age. And it declines in a very, very specific region. You only see the decline in the dentate gyrus. You don't see it in the entorhinal cortex. You don't see it in other regions of the hippocampus, which I'm not showing you. What is RBAB48? Turns out that it's an old friend. I mentioned to you before that long-term memory gets triggered by cyclic AMP activating CREB1. CREB1 recruits a partner, the CREB binding protein, but they don't really activate genes until they recruit RBAB48, which is a histone acetylase. It acetylates lysine residues, and that allows you to alter the chromatin to open it up so you can transcribe genes. So it really throws the switch that allows you to turn a gene on. So it's a very important component of this tripartite switch. So in humans, you can do these wonderful correlation experiments but you can't do causal experiments. For causal experiments, you have to turn to experimental animals, and we turn to mice. And we ask the question, if humans show a systematic decline in RBAB48, do mice also show a systematic decline? Because we know they have an age-related memory loss. And if you look, you see that in the dentate gyrus, there is in a normal mouse, as it ages, this is a young mouse, this is an old mouse, a deficit in RBAB48. Moreover, it's specific to the dentate gyrus. You don't see it in any other region of the hippocampus. I only show you CA3, CA1 by comparison. Now we can do something very nice. We can express this gene. We can block the gene. We can block the gene and turn it off. So let me show you what we did. Can you take, I showed you that an old mouse has a definite RBAB48. What happens if we take a young mouse and shut off RBAB48? Can we create in the young mouse age-related memory loss? This is a young mouse. This is an old mouse. This is a young mouse in which RBAB48 is functioning. But here, we shut RBAB48 off as a genetic trick. We then allow it to come back, and memory comes back. So we can recreate age-related memory loss in a young mouse by turning off this gene. That's pretty, that's pretty effective here. <laughs> um, can we restore memory in an old mouse by enhancing the expression of RBAB48? And the answer is yes. This is an old mouse. We now give it RBAB48, and boom, restored the memory loss. So we can now ask the question, I told you before, you can pick up, I'm being I carried away with myself here, you, you can pick up in humans a deficit in aging in the dentate gyrus. We carried out, Scott Small and our group carried out this experiment in mice, and we saw with elderly mice, you saw in fact this defect. 
Again, quite specific in the Dente Gyrus, if you inhibit RBAB48. So you inhibit this one gene, you can recapitulate the aging deficit that is characterized, characteristic of the old mouse and of old people. The rest of the hippocampus, you don't see this deficit. So let me summarize what I've told you so far. I think this provides the clearest evidence yet that there is a distinct entity, age-related memory loss, that is separate from Alzheimer's disease. Its onset is earlier. It begins in midlife. Contrast to Alzheimer's disease, which sporadically begins much later. The anatomical localization is different, dente gyrus versus enteronal cortex. And it involves RBAB48, which is part of the Krebs system, while there is no such abnormality uh, in Alzheimer's disease. Now, the fact is, you know, we're all, you know, very athletic. I mean, look at the shape that Zuckerman is in, for God's sakes. This guy works out. He's got a trainer, blah, 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 blah. Does this have any meaning? Does this affect any of these processes we're talking about? Can exercise help overcome age-related memory loss? Everyone says it does. Is there any evidence for it? So in the last few months, two new factors have emerged that I want to sort of finish my talk telling you about. One is young blood, which you're not going to get a, a, a transfusion of tonight. Uh, and the other is young bones. Young blood is a very cockamamie experiment that was carried out by a group that just published in Nature Medicine, in which they cross perfused an old mouse with the blood from a young mouse. Old mouse had a cognitive deficit. When they exchanged blood and gave it the blood from a young mouse, they improved this cognitive deficit and it functioned like a young mouse. So there's something in young blood that's good for you. Now, we knew this all along. My mother told me young blood is good. Here, this is the final proof. My mother was right. She usually was. <laughs> but what are these factors that are carried by blood? We don't know, but I'm going to indicate to you one candidate. That comes from young bones. This is the work of Jared Kersenke at Columbia, chairman of the genetics department, who's made a wonderful discovery. He's found that bone is an endocrine organ. It releases a hormone called osteocalcin. Osteocalcin acts on the muscle. It acts on the liver. It acts on fatty tissue, both white and, and black fatty tissue. It acts on, test in, on the testes. It acts on the pancreas. But in addition to all of these visceral organs it acts on, it acts on the mind. It acts on the brain. And Gerard has found that it increases the level of these modulatory transmitters that I was talking about, dopamine, serotonin. It increases neurogenesis, which we're not going to go into. So it also, in so doing, prevents some of the consequences of deficiencies in these modulatory transmitters, like depression and anxiety. It reduces an inhibitory transmitter called GABA. And it also favors hippocampal-dependent spatial learning and memory. So my colleagues and I began to speak to Gerard to see what happens in age-related memory loss. You know, is osteocalcin helpful there? So we looked at the candidate molecules that we'd identified, the cyclic AMP-dependent protein kinase, CREB, and RBAB48. We found that we gave osteocalcin, we improved the level of each one of these candidates. So you give this to an old mouse and up come the level of each one of these. If you knock out osteocalcin, you reduce the levels of them. What are the behavioral consequences of osteocalcin? <clears throat> Novel object recognition task, which is, uh, requires the hippocampus. This is a young mouse. This is an old mouse. This is the old mouse. This is the old mouse with osteocalcin. So this one substance causes a nice restoration of age-related memory loss. But it doesn't simply work in the aged, which I showed you before. You take a young mouse, and you improve their performance by giving them more osteocalcin. So even the young people in this audience are probably not working on their maximal functional level. This applies even to my young friend sitting in the first row. 
if you look at the level of osteocalcin in the blood as a function of age, you see it decreases progressively with age. So what do you think is likely to bring that back? Exercise. A simple running task begins to bring the level up. This only stays up transiently because you're only doing it for a short period of time. But it's certainly one possibility that we're now testing is if you now expose the mouse to long periods of running, whether you can bring the level up in a more sustained fashion and have a significant sustaining effect on age-related memory loss, number one. And number two, even though it's a cockamamie experiment, Gerard and I want to see whether or not this is one of the key factors in young blood that rescues the old mouse. So let me simply summarize the second part, which deals with these factors, that osteocalcin released by bone ameliorates age-related memory loss, and it does it through the players that are important in age-related memory loss. And because with aging, there is a decrease in bone mass, you are in fact releasing less osteocalcin in the blood. And exercise is one way of keeping the moment, and this is particularly true for women, where bone mass decreases more significantly than with men. That exercise allows you to keep that level high. And both osteocalcin and the factors carried by young blood act through CREB1. I didn't tell you that the factor that acts through young blood also acts through CREB1. And this, I think, provides additional evidence to the fact that one can separate age-related memory loss from Alzheimer's disease as distinct entities and tells you, as you probably know, that a sound body helps assure a sound mind. Let me simply point out the colleagues in my lab that did this work, and particularly uh, uh, Stelius Cosmides, who I think is here, who's carried out uh, the experiments on, on osteocalcin, has made a wonderful contribution. And of course, the osteocalcin discovery itself is Gerard Kasenke, and he did a lot of the classic early work, and Frank Auri and Laura Carman, with whom we've had the privilege of collaborating here, and I think Laura is also here, have made wonderful contributions. So I want to thank you for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you very much. be delighted to ask any easy questions. Save your hard questions for later. Any questions, please? Charles. I'll save it for later. Okay. <laughs> Mort. Uh, I think at any point in your life, this can help. But obviously, earlier is better. But I think if any one of us begin at this stage, I think one can help. So I think it's extremely important. Yes. In fact, if you, if you look at just the, the, stat uh, the statistics, why do people live so much longer? Until this recent obesity epidemic, there was a general tendency for people to, number one, stop smoking, which was dramatic, because in this audience, 25 years ago, most people were going out and having a smoke right away. No longer happens, although e-cigarettes may bring that back. Uh, and they do more exercise and they eat better. So really, public health measures have proven to be extremely important. And my guess is they're also important for age-related memory loss. I actually have a question. Yes. New exercise? Yes. What do you do? I, I am fortunate enough to work in a building that is next door to the student dormitory, and it has a pool. And I try on most days to get there and swim. And when I travel, I take my bathing suit with me, and the rest of the, you know, doesn't take a lot of equipment to swim. And I try to go to hotels where there's a pool. I'm invariably the slowest person in the pool. <laughs> That's my claim to fame. But I try to swim as often as possible. And on the weekends, I play tennis. I play singles. I assure you, you can beat me. So don't worry about that. But I do play singles. 
Yes. What's the, what's you, the mechanism? In order to get this effect of bone mass, swimming is probably not the best exercise. Walking is a superb exercise. In people my age, walking is a superb exercise. And I'm actually moving to Manhattan from Riverdale. In Riverdale, you drive every place. In Manhattan, you walk every place. So one of the... I'm sorry? What's the mechanism, the biochemical mechanism, for producing osteocalcin? It, it, is, it there is a machinery in bone that generates osteocalcin, and it is released with exercise and probably with other things. There are other things that act on bone that do this. Question there? Uh, well, hi, my name is Jean Washington. Thank you for your talk. Um, so I was thinking that it would be a very interesting study if looked at those who are paralyzed and um, those who are paralyzed and what would be their, um, I guess, their rate of age-related um, memory loss. I didn't hear the, the group of people you're referring to. Uh, those who are paralyzed. Those who are paralyzed. Yes. You know, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a very good question. Uh, Tom, do you, know the, <laughs> do you know the answer to that? Whether there's an increase in age-related memory loss in people who are paralyzed? Yeah, so it would be on it would be on early. Yeah, the, it's an excellent question. I just don't know the answer to that. It's probably known. Dr. Kandel, I was wondering. Herb, do you know that? Oh, I see. <laughs> can, Tom, can do you know? Do yeah. Herb. Uh, I can't quite repeat it because I didn't get all of it, but I think you said, what is my recommendation? I say, what would your recommendations be if you wanted to optimize these uh, new notions in order to give uh, it the greatest I, clinical I utility? I think that probably the best thing and the easiest thing to recommend is walking. And walking at a brisk clip. And they've actually defined the amount of walking they have to do. Sort of, let's say, a half an hour minimal every day. I mean, it's got to be a serious workout. It can't be just going, you know, to the grocery store and back if that's around the corner. Uh, and I think this would be extremely beneficial. And obviously, one needs to do outcome studies. And there is actually a group at Columbia, Ursula Staubing is involved in that. I'm actually helping her a little bit with that. That is systematically studying the aging population. Also being intellectually involved. Um, that, you know, one has done studies that has shown if you take a group of women 70 years old and you divide them into two, you ask one group to go into elementary school class and help the kids that have difficulty with reading. So these women have had no teaching experience, but they all know how to read, so they work with these kids and help them with their reading. The other 70, the other uh, uh, half of the population, age 70, doesn't do anything. They go along as a control. If you do cognitive tests six, 12 months later, you find that the women who are involved in remedial teaching function better on a variety of cognitive tasks. There is now great interest, and actually I'm gonna do a, a program with Charlie Rose on this, on, in cognitive enhancement through video games. Mort will tell you the world is being changed by access to this. And it's addictive for many people, particularly young people. But older people also enjoy playing video games. And the issue that is now the concern is people can improve quite dramatically in the video games. But the question is, is it specific to the particular video game, or does it generalize to cognitive embellishment as a whole? Do you see what I mean? There are some sports that you become very good at, but doesn't help you with other sports. So there's some tasks that you can become very good with a video game, but it may not generalize to broader knowledge. That needs to be explored. But all of these things are opening up, and this is why I think the Zuckerman Mind Brain Behavior Institute has a future. There are many unsolved questions in this one area alone. Del, I was, I was wondering, 
to what extent is the effect of exercise? I'm over here. Um, Can I yes. ask my question? To what extent is the effect of exercise truly protective? So if, so if a patient exercises most of his life and then, then stops exercising, does his age-related memory decline go back to where it, it might have been early, or does it, it, does it advance? We don't know the answer to that. Because you need to do systematic epidemiological studies in order to show that. You can't use a single patient as an example. Uh, I must tell you that's unusual. Most people who do exercise in a fairly systematic and religious way become addicted to it. They feel lousy when they don't do it. So I think it's a rare case, but I don't know the answer to this. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. What happens in a case of what? What happens if, if a patient has a stroke or breaks a hip, it falls down, and they can't exercise? You know, to the extent to which then people don't. These are wonderful questions. Athletes. Look, I'm outlining for you a set of questions that are just emerging. Right? We didn't have good evidence until a couple of years ago that age-related memory loss is in fact a distinct entity different from Alzheimer's disease. So now we have a distinct entity. We have reason to believe from animal models and from preliminary human uh, experience that this is a more reversible age-related memory deficit and preventable as you move along. But we're at an early stage. We need to do large-scale clinical trials, which would be easy to do on this. Yes? One, you've described one physiological pathway and presented wonderful evidence for it. I'm wondering if there might be other pathways. Of course. Of, I okay. should have said that. So it's that. more complicated. This, I don't mean to say that osteocalcin is the only magic bullet out there. Okay. I'm saying it's encouraging to think that there is a significant factor out there. There are others probably that are also important. I completely agree with you. So do you know the effect size? Or that there's no way of really estimating effect size? No, no, no. Thank you. Dr. Kandel, I have a question over here to your left. Your left, yeah. Um, I'm just curious if um, either in mouse models or in human models, if there's been any studies on gender differences, because I know that um, females are more likely to have osteoporosis and different bone issues. So I'm wondering if like that would like then have a large larger memory loss than just age-related stuff for female, either mice or patients? That's is your question whether people with osteoporosis have a greater memory loss than those who don't? Basically, yeah. One, do, one doesn't really know this. This is, again, this is a question one can really look at because there is, in a great hospital like you know, New York Presbyterian, you know, a lot of data on people with osteoporosis, and one can begin to do cognitive tests on them. You see, when a patient comes into a hospital with osteoporosis, he doesn't routinely get cognitive examination at all. But this is something that probably will be part, just like taking a blood pressure and taking EKG, cognitive exams will become routine as we realize that this is a, a, a variable that can be, can, can be manipulated therapeutically. Yes, Paul. I think in, uh, I, we don't know in terms of osteocalcin. I've given you all the data we have so far. But certainly one has the feeling that diet you know, leads to healthy living, leads to encouraging people to grow. So I think it's very important. This is why the obesity epidemic in the United States is frightening. Uh, now it's really spreading into Europe as well. It's just really terrible. Um. Um, hi, Dr. Kandel. Uh, here, waving right yes. in front of you. Oh. That was you, Tom. Um, so I apologize because this may not be an easy question, but I will. Hopefully, it is. Sure. So when you give with the exercise, right? With a one bout of exercise, you have a transient increase in osteocalcin, and then you have a transient improvement in memory, and then it goes back to normal. When you do the blood transfusion from the young mice, that effect in the older mice persists, even though. It's just one sort of dose of blood. So doesn't that? No, the, the, the cross perfusion experiment, but it's a relatively acute experiment, they didn't carry these mice for very long periods of time. Okay. So one doesn't know whether, when osteocalcin is metabolized, whether they go back. This needs to be done. This is a field that is just emerging. 
and you're asking extremely good, sophisticated questions that have not yet been explored. I laid it on the table because of that very fact. I think it's interesting. This is a literature we want to follow and work we want to encourage because it can really affect a large number of people. Yes? What about the research you did on gender profiling in the brain language? Um, I'm asking about the recent research showing that drinking cocoa mm -hmm. leads to improved cognitive function. There are, 400, the there are 400 claims of this sort with different kinds of, you know, pills, vitamins, etc. Uh, none of them are really very, very convincing. Uh, one really needs to do very systematic trials in order to make claims like that. They may be right, but at the moment it's not convincing. Doc. Doctor, uh, this gentleman here. Has a, I'm sorry. So yes. So we, we have a large patient cohort that's been on bisphosphonates for some time, including IV bisphosphonates, which block uh, you know, osteoclastic activity. There are new drugs that are coming along that may increase osteoblastic. But is there any information? Are there any data on the patients who have been on these for quite some time as to whether they might have Dan, we're waiting for you to do that study. I think it's a great we need, idea. We need funding, as we all do. <laughs> Dr. Kendall? Dr. Kendall, on your left? On your left? Um, so osteocalcin uh, seems to be inversely correlated with, with memory, at least in aging. Is there any other cognitive effect of osteocalcin that um, perhaps there's a reason for it decreasing over time that would give older people some advantage, or is it for now thought to be just involved in memory? Well, from, uh, it's involved in other things besides memory. I think I pointed out to you that it also affects modulatory systems in the brain that are important for anxiety and for depression in a beneficial way. This may also account for the fact that elderly people have a greater tendency for depression that may be related to it, but I'm just guessing here. Uh, so, you know, when it's just beginning to explore this, um, it does other things besides memory, a large number of effects besides memory. Uh, first of all, I've only been speaking about things that affect the brain. It also affects many other organs in the body, as one of my slides illustrated. Yes. Is there any hope for the Alzheimer's patient except for loving care? Yes. I think there is great hope for Alzheimer's. Uh, I think the issue right now is there are probably several, th this is, I don't work in this area, I'm passing on to you what is contemporary thought, that there are several, we, we, one has the feeling that from a scientific point of view, the understanding we have of the pathogenesis of Alzheimer's is probably pretty advanced. Uh, there are several treatments out there that according to our current understanding of pathogenesis should be effective. They have not proven to be effective by and large. And the reason that is thought to be the case is by the time a patient presents with significant symptoms, so it's obvious that he has Alzheimer's disease or even you know, earlier than that, the patient has had the disease for some time. And if you've had any disease for five to 10 years, difficult to reverse it. So the effort now is to try to stop people earlier, to try to use diagnostic ways of imaging, plaque formation, maybe even get to cerebral spinal fluid levels of uh, A beta, to be able to detect these things at an earlier point so one can institute therapy earlier, as well as looking for new therapeutic approaches. But I, I think most people working in the area feel that even though it's been disappointing so far, we're on the verge of significant advance in Alzheimer's disease also. There is a question out there on the balcony. Uh, Hi. Um, I was wondering if it, you could answer the question, is it possible to synthetically produce this substance? And if so, do you think it could be beneficial in the prevention or treatment of learning disabilities in young children that impair memory. Did you hear? I didn't, we, neither of us heard you. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, is this, okay. Please. I was wondering if it was possible to synthetically produce this substance in order to prevent or treat uh, learning disabilities that impair memory in young children or in adolescents. 
learning impairment, I, I, I don't want you to get a simple idea that all learning impairments is osteocalcin, and that, that's just nonsense. There are many reasons for having learning impairments. For example, there could be some developmental abnormality that leads to learning impairment. We know that there are a number of these that happen. Uh, those would not be helped by these approaches. But, you know, these things, again, in principle, are amenable to analysis and understanding. It's a more difficult problem, but there's no reason one couldn't get at this. But there are many, many reasons for cognitive impairment, particularly in young people. Um, also, is it able to be produced synthetically? The osteocalcin, can it be produced synthetically? Could one? So could osteocalcin be produced synthetically? Yes, there is no reason why that couldn't be used, but there's no reason to believe that this would be helpful in young kids with cognitive impairment. See, because as far as one knows, or we can measure this, their, their blood osteocalcin level is probably reasonable. They have young bones. But I don't want you to walk away thinking that this osteocalcin thing which I'm throwing out as an initial clue, as a contributing factor potentially to age-related memory loss, is the panacea. You know, the brain is extremely complicated. There are many things that can go wrong and produce cognitive impairment. That are, that are not related to osteocalcin. We'll take two more questions. One is in the back here. Thank you so much for being here and for inviting the alumni to listen to you. It's We're been, delighted that you're um, here. I am you delighted that I am here. Um, you, uh, I've read a few of your books. Um, I study um, contemplative sciences. And I'm interested to know what your um, understanding or um, connection that you might have with monks who have been studied, that they've, had, they've done a lot of research science on the effects of meditation. And I'm wondering if in that population, as the elders of, of these Tibetan monks, primarily who've been studied, um, do you see the effects of meditation having um, very positive effects towards cognition and memory. I'm neither a monk <laughs> nor a meditator, but I have several friends who get enormous benefit out of meditation. Uh, and I would not be surprised. Um, also, I think, for example, um, if you're depressed, and you respond effectively to cognitive behavior therapy or to dynamic psychotherapy, I think the chances are this not only will improve the quality of life, but longevity. To just give you an absurd example, if you're not depressed, you're less likely to do harm to yourself. Okay, but there are other reasons. Probably, you know, your lifestyle is more dynamic if you're not depressed. Many other things change. So insofar as meditation helps people it probably has you know, a variety of, of offsprings. I just have no direct experience with that. But there are people who have experience with that. We have you, one, yeah. one final question at the back there. You have a microphone. Um, Dr. Kandel, um, I believe that in some of the Scandinavian countries, they have wonderful epidemiological studies going back. Do you think there's any possibility that data mining of that You're absolutely studies right. No, no, we are, uh, Gerard and I have actually talked about this. We're doing this in another case. We've identified in a completely different context. A gene that is involved in post-traumatic stress disorder, it's called TIA, and we're now looking at Scandinavian populations to see whether there's also a marker for other anxiety states. It's a fantastic population. It's been used for schizophrenia studies, for depression studies. It's, it's a very valuable resource. The question was whether it might have hidden in it the effects of what you're talking about absolutely. here that absolutely. nobody's seen before. I, I think it's worthwhile looking into. You're absolutely right. I just want to end with two comments. Yes. One is that Eric is being a little modest and self-effacing. He, he has held his own with Tina Turner in hours of German television. And so issues of transcendental states are not new to Eric. 
The second point is that in science, there is a continuum between the audacity of bold hypothesis and the pursuit of the frankly absurd with a fine margin. And Eric, for 50 years, as I think you've heard this evening, has found this way of choosing bold hypothesis that quickly transformed into the accepted canon of neural science. And we've been treated to a masterclass in that this evening. And Eric, we're all very much in your debt. That was great.